Question. What is the primary, primary characteristic of anything that exists? Answer. The primary characteristic is that it has characteristics. <laughs> there is nothing that exists of which man can be conscious of the 3D level unless it has characteristics. And yet the world is full of, even if you never thought about it in those terms, of discussions about the characteristics of everything, humans, ideas, <coughs> philosophies, religions, nations, attitudes, history, everything. When you get down to what used to be the basic one, the main characteristic of something, even a person, was, is the person good? Is the idea good? Or is the person evil? Is what he says or she does? Is it evil? And now, I guess it would be running at least a close second, is the person actually intelligent? That is, what they're doing, what they're trying to teach or what they're trying to develop, is it in fact pertinent? Is the data well-founded? In other words, the truth against falsity. That that would be important characteristics. That would be, I suggest to you, at the common denominator of everything of which man has ever been conscious, including himself. But now, I ask you again, what is the most common characteristic? Notwithstanding what I just said. If it exists, the most common characteristic is this. It is the bare minimum. It's got to have damn characteristics. What would exist with no characteristics? Let me tell you that from a certain view, and it's outside the 3D city limits, from a certain view, someone attempting to do this is attempting to become a person without characteristics. It's characteristics on the basis that all characteristics in the city are obvious. I repeat one more time, I'm not going into all of this because you should be able to go and play along with yourself. They're not necessarily referred to as characteristics. But how can you be conscious of anything? I ask rhetorically, which you can't. But how can you be conscious of anything? Does it not to you have characteristics? Think about it a second. Anything. Whether you like it, whether you use it, whether you laugh at it, whether you used to have one and lost it, whether you used to know people like that and you grew tired of them. Anything. If you can think of it. All the way from aardvarks to zebras, from asparagus to zucchini, from Mr. Akabilt to... I did it. Eli Zuckerman. I did it. From an Alfa Romeo to a... Think about it. You cannot think of anything without it having characteristics, and the characteristics are obvious. And just because they seem to be debatable, just because there seems to have been some question about the particular characteristics of anything, of anybody, that's not the point. The point is they've got characteristics. That's the only point. If they don't have characteristics, they do not exist. They cannot exist. They could not have filtered down and be seen in the 3D world without there being characteristics. But now, apparently, part of human's job, humanity's job is to debate, if not fight, over the characteristics. And people believe that characteristics can be changed. Why else? This is really getting from a savanna into a marsh, I guess, or from a marsh into quicksand. I wasn't going this far. But other than strictly yellow circuit reasons, what has life to gain by the fact of making men believe that some things are true and some things are not true. When, if I wanted to stop and really drag you into the quicksand tonight, I can prove to those of you with at least three eyes that there's no such thing as the not true. If you can think about it, it's true. If you can think about it, it's obvious. If you can think about it, it's got characteristics. It exists. Back to just the marshlands. Wherein in the city, everyone is made to believe that the characteristics of the thing, the particular characteristics are important when it comes to additional sight, whether I'm calling it revolutionary sight or beyond 3D sight, it is not the particular characteristic any longer. 
as you've got to see at the bare level, you cannot be conscious of anything. It does not exist, literally, unless it has characteristics. And after that, it becomes a matter, from a revolutionary view, of people arguing over that which is irrelevant, truly irrelevant. Not 3D irrelevant, but truly irrelevant. To believe that something could have a better characteristic, or conversely, if you can follow this at all, to believe that certain characteristics of a thing, something that is known primarily in a negative sense, that its characteristics are questionable, that they can be done away with, that the characteristics in some way, somehow, have got to be malleable, that you've got to be able to change it, to convert it, to do away with the characteristics and still have the thing. That would be like finally, I guess, doing a variation of the torture of 10,000 little pieces and pass it off as being surgery. That is, operate on a guy until there's nothing left of him. Just keep cutting out little bits and pieces. At least he couldn't go to an attorney and sue for malpractice. But you just keep working on them until finally they look down at the, at the table and there's nothing left of you except, you know, maybe your belt. If, and that's it. <laughs> Back to ordinary consciousness, though. I fear that no one has even got up to airboat speed yet. The characteristics themselves, any particular characteristics, are literally moot. That is not the beginning place. But notice in your life, and it's not just morality, it's not just philosophy, you think about about people that they've got certain characteristics, and were it not for these characteristics, they might be tolerable, <laughs> if, not, if not even likable. <laughs> but what you're talking about is performing operations on a person. Well, to give you another variation, I guess, of the joke I was getting at, is a physician saying, well, the operation was a success, but the patient died. <laughs> <laughs> that this person would really be great if, and then what they're saying, what I'm trying to get you to see tonight, after that, what they're saying, if the characteristics, as I see them, of course, ordinary people don't even put it that way. They say the characteristics are real. You know, the person is a prick. It's not my opinion. They just simply are. They're, <laughs> the person is just uncouth, ill-mannered, dumb. They are, I just hate it that it just happens that uh, she's my mother. <laughs> but what they're saying is the characteristics can't be changed. And without the characteristics, you would not have the person. And I am not... Again, if I must say it, and I must, I am not playing with words. The main characteristics, the common characteristics of everything that exists is that they have characteristics. Without that, they do not exist. Without that, they are not obvious. Without characteristics, nothing can be defined, nothing can be seen. And now does that strike anyone in a familiar place about the great e pool? Yeah. You would close the door on any change if characteristics, the way that appears to be in the city, possible, the way that at least to ordinary consciousness it seems imperative that we at least try to, or at least we try to think about it, at least we try to discuss changing the characteristics of life, of individuals, and of the nature of life. If that could be done in the way it's perceived in the city, that is almost willy-nilly, that is almost you here, you over there, you could turn and say, well, I got an old man and he ain't bad, but it, it, two or three things about him, that is characteristics I don't like, and my family, oh, and this country, since the Republicans have taken over, I think we've gotten too weak on this and that. And we've, all right, if you could, and then the other person over here, and then somebody else, and it was everybody's turn. Right quick, you got whatever it takes, a minute to change all the characteristics you don't like. What would happen? <laughs> well, it'd be like taking, I guess, a frog skin and turning it inside out. Some of the characteristics would seem to have popped up somewhere else. And all of the complaints you had over here, you'd think, boy, they're gone now. And it's like you took a pimple and mashed it in. And you look behind you, and oh, there it is. 
My mother seems a lot better now, but now I can't stand my father. <laughs> or now I don't worry so much about the ecology anymore since I got my characteristic wish taken care of. But now suddenly, I can't even sleep at night because I just know they're going to drop the big bomb before the night's over. That's what would happen. There's nowhere to put characteristics. They're not going to go away. You, you can't sand them down. <laughs> Dr. Scholes did not make anything that you can rub against your characteristics and other people's and they go away. <laughs> Several people have made little comments and written me notes uh, that they found some interest in me saying that in a sense a person doing this should, for instance, and I meant it both literally and then of course a lot more because the literal part is almost meaningless. But I said that your apartment or your house, that one thing that you could use as a kind of method would almost live as though that your house looked unlived in. And several people found that interesting. Now, there's nothing wrong with that literally. When I started out, when I brought it up, I meant it literally. It would be with most of you. Of course, if any of you are suffering from any regular 3D maladies back in the city, like some kind of whatever the name is, you know, tidy phobia. <laughs> if all your life, if, you, if you've been going around, you know, dusting every five minutes and all that, then, of course, this is fairly meaningless. <laughs> but if you willfully... If you willfully lived, existed in such a way just in what seems to be what is your current domicile, that if you somebody looked in, it's almost as though it's unlived in. There are no crumbs. You almost left no trail. It's set up, and it almost looks like a little model house, a little model apartment. But it's almost as though you have disturbed nothing. It's almost as though it has been unlived in. Since some of you find that interesting, could any of you see any connection between that and internally? As being a person almost with no characteristics, that internally it's almost as though, no, of course only you can see it, some other people can't suspect it, such as you're shallow and dull. <laughs> you don't have any more flamboyant opinions. At any rate, that internally in a certain way, if you could see it, it's almost as though you're unlived in. <laughs> I don't mean to even apparently pick on the same crowd, but here and in other times and other places, I know how this song has been going, even though it's changing in our lifetime. But many people who show up for such as this or read those books that I wrote publicly, I guess nowadays we could lump them all right quick into would-be New Agers, all the old ideas about enlightenment, all the old ideas about extended consciousness and all that, please note, to use my descriptions again, what people were dreaming of and what they were expecting from some kind of activity like this was to get more what? More characteristics. <laughs> be more interesting. Be more powerful. I'll have new abilities, whatever they are, read minds, be able to pick up crystals, and I can listen to you know, WVEE -E without even having a tuner. The very thing that if there is some way to improve upon myself, if there is some way that a person can evolve in their lifetime under whatever name it goes, what they dream of is I would have more characteristics. Nobody even thinks about it. I would be much more interesting, to say the least. Of course, many people, they believe not only I'd be interesting, I could just pull into a city in the city limits and suddenly throughout Boston, Cleveland, the ramifications, they would, they would feel my spiritual vibrations. And as far as just walking in a room, uh, I just, I'd light it up like a 40-watt bulb. People would, people, would know, people would know that they were in the presence of somebody with mucho characteristics. Man of great depth, great complexity, and of course, along with that always goes a great deal of heartbreak. I just threw that in. But, but everybody believes that, that if I was all that wise and all that great, boy, think of the new ways I would suffer and be moody. But it would be understandable, and I deserve it. You know. 
the great weight on the weight of the world on my back. As opposed to that, now neither one of these are true, since I can put them into words, neither one of them are correct. But as opposed to that, then what I'm suggesting to you, as opposed to that, mine is closer to the truth. My description, that is, that you might turn out to be almost a house that if you knew how to look at it, or if you could make some ordinary person they could look in. What everybody else believes is the internal life that is so complex, most of it unconscious and all that stuff, that you look down inside of you and it's almost as though it's unlived in. Oh, you know somebody's there, there's magazines, there's information, coffee table, furniture, but you look and it's almost as though nobody lives there. If somebody fixed it all up and then left and they hadn't come back. Or if they do, if they do come back, you don't ever catch them. And whatever they do, they straighten back just like it was. That you're almost unlived in. For the night, I got another one. This kind of stuff that I always... I guess I picked up from Baptist or, I guess I'll say Baptist instead of Assembly of God after what's happened to them. This old thing, what I read just recently, this is the one for the night. I read that it says, he who goes alone can travel whenever he wishes, but he who travels with another must wait until the other is ready to go. <laughs> Knowing how sexist and chauvinistic men's been, this is beside the point. I guess we can all assume that some sore-headed man wrote that about his wife. But he who travels alone can go whenever he wishes. But he who's going to travel with another, here and there at some time, has got to wait until the other is ready to go. Now, since I started playing this, can anybody see any possible significance to that, with that, with the revolutionist and the partnership? Is everybody so <laughs> full of the holidays I'm going to have to turn all this into baby talk? The first part, the opening part, when I did the bit about, hey, I read. Everybody got that, didn't they? <laughs> In the city, at the crudest, basic, material level, that's simply true. If you're going to travel, and it's just you, you can go anytime you want to. Wake up in the middle of the night, continue the trip, and if you got somebody else, no matter what kind of soulmates you seem to be, if you and somebody else is traveling, it's not right or wrong necessarily, but just within the confines of the axiom itself, is you can no longer go when you wish, because you've always got to wait for the other person, if indeed you are traveling together. So you've always got to wait on them, to some degree. That is one of the characteristics of other people. That's one of the characteristics of there being another. See, in the axiom just said, if one is traveling alone by oneself, one can go whenever one wishes. But if you are traveling with another, if internally, you, as everyone else is supposed to be, that you are suffering under the dictates of a partnership, a heretofore ill-defined partnership. The ambivalence that is as much of human life as breath. If you're traveling with two, I don't care. What if the other two? What if your other? What if your other even gets back to school and gets his or her PhD? What if your other is talented, can write, play music, tap dance, brilliant conversationalist? None of that matters if you're interested in traveling. Because as long as you've got another, you've got to wait until the other person's ready to go. Now, who has ever had their partner ready to go at exactly the same time to go to the same place that you wanted to go? All right, the answer is, you can't really think of any, and I can tell you, besides your last, if you want to hear it mathematically, even if it's happened, you've forgotten about it because it disappeared. That was perfection. The act was completed. If at one time, this could happen just by, as they used to call it in Alabama, 
The laws of averages will catch up with you, son. <laughs> that one time in your life it may have been that you wanted to travel somewhere, that you wanted to go, and right then, it's the great cosmic accident, the other, your traveling partner, was too, right then. But you can't remember that. That's why you laughed. As soon as those of you who heard what I was asking, because all you can remember is, it's never been that way. Anytime I want to do something, of course, ordinary people say, well, there's some kind of pressure. Something's holding me back, other people. But those of you who correctly laughed, using the description I am tonight, the laughter is that every time I want to travel, this other son of a bitch, it's always something. Like, wait a minute, I got to take a shower. I'm too tired. Wait till tomorrow. You shut all this yesterday. Or just a non, a non-verbal that it just won't cooperate. If it's ever happened by accident, you can't remember it, which turns it into the non-obvious, which it turns it into something with no characteristics, which runs it back to the e-pool. You can't remember it. It turned the corner and disappeared. It was one act that was completed. Therefore, it's gone. Speaking of notes, let me drag in a few more that I've received more than several notes about the things I brought up at one time or the other recently. One was somebody took the time to mention to me some observations they had about being involved sexually, romantically with somebody else involved with this, somebody in the group and about how they found themselves continuing to look at the other people that they've ever been involved with here, to look at them as being a source or an image of a new hero. That they felt as though anybody involved with this that they would get involved with, romantically. That the other, your mate, for the time being, is going to perform heroically. Defer to you, perhaps always concerned about how you're doing, are you having fun, is everything all right? <laughs> the strong one, and that's not the way it should go. Okay, that's not the way it goes. <laughs> For a second, I'll stay with the example of a romantic relationship, a sexual relationship between two people involved with this use that as the springboard. You, you should force yourself to act in your own heroic way. It's not wait for somebody to defer to you. Not wait for somebody to apparently play out the imagined figure of a stronger person. And of course, the way things biologically, the way things literally have been, and it still is a great wide influence amongst all of you, is that that seemed to be superficially the kind of relationship of a woman and a man, of the woman assuming, just naturally, that the man is going to be the strong one. But then to be involved with this, to even be more so, my hero, surely, my kind of living example. It is not limited just sexually, but I want to point out that I'm aware of that because that still affects all of you to some degree. Not right or wrong, it simply is. That is, like everything else, but I just want to stress, that is harmonic down to the basis. We're talking about hormones with a big H. Hormones with a big H underlined, hormones with a big H underlined, and an arrow saying two flights up, or one <laughs> flight down. <laughs> Open seven days a week. <laughs> It is the hormones that dictate the idea and your particular image of a hero. I would, of course, point out to you again, in the area of what is lacking, that which seems to be your unfinished business, your hormones know what they are, and so they have pictures of heroes. And one easy place has been women doing it to men. One more time, I repeat, that is not the end of it. So that was a comma, and don't you stop there, any of you men or women. I guess that about covers it. Don't stop there. 
under any condition, you should be forcing yourself because you've already got an idea of what a hero is to you. We're not arguing that. There's some idea of a hero to you. Maybe somebody just simply never complains. Somebody's never sick. If they're sick, they won't admit it. Somebody seems to always know what they're doing. It should be your duty to act that way. Act that way. Require that you act to you in what is a heroic manner. And you cannot listen. You cannot entertain this kind of internal babble from the partnership of I don't really feel it. You know, what do you feel? We're going to stop and spend another 30 years with you now about, well, I don't feel that way. <laughs> Give us a break. That is you and me. What do you feel? And then you have to take 30 years to try and tell me, and what ends up is, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, here's a way to be sure. As you force yourself to act, you require that you act in a heroic manner. It not only, by the way, is good for you, but I will point out that the relationship is good. It doesn't matter whether this is coming from men to women or vice versa. It is good for the relationship, but you eventually have got to do it. There's a certain way in which eventually you've got to go it alone. If you're going to travel forever, you're only going to get so far. And so you're eventually going to be somebody traveling alone. And if you're going to do that, you have got to act out your own heroic image. It's not necessary that anybody else particularly notice it. It's not a show with the very things that you would expect to be the heroic manifestations of another person, somebody that you admire and that you hope that they're going to be this way. You hope to find someone who will be this way. Go ahead and do it. Even if you find somebody, all you've taken is another traveling partner. And it doesn't matter how good they are, you still can't go when you want to if you've got to wait on them. If there's going to be any apparent heroic image, you have got to do it. You've got to do it for yourself. You have got to require that you act that way. And not, of course, entertain this would-be traveler. This would be bum to say, well, wait a minute, I don't feel that way. Some more, what would be Latin for loose ends, make it sound better. Some more loose ends, I don't know. This has an effect, has its effect on people getting involved with this. And I've had a few mentions of this recently, so I'll bring it back up for you. You knew people here and other times and other places. That many people go through periods of feeling like, and of course they attribute it all to this, but feeling like that now that they've been involved with this and going on a certain way, that at times they begin to fear that they are losing control. That happens to many, many people. And I don't guess I've mentioned it recently. If you feel like you're losing control, immediately regain it. <laughs> no ifs, no ands, no buts, none. And you can do that. But uh, I do want you to understand that I fully understand I wouldn't be doing this. <coughs> that it seems to run in many times parallel to new understanding. That is, that you find it possible what's been going on. It seems like it's verging, even though I seem to laugh and make fun, that you really feel like I'm getting close to what I used to imagine surely was some kind of unusual state of consciousness or this is beginning to feel even better than some of the stuff I used to smoke and drink. And yet, sometimes it seems for a while that you're almost verging like, well, it's getting too great. I could be just losing control here. I'm not even going into what it is, except I understand it. And I just want to tell you very simply, very directly, if you feel like you're losing control, immediately regain control. And it's almost as simple as spitting, looking off, 
taking a deep breath, just saying to yourself, well, I got to stop this. That's how hard it is. <laughs> the point is, if you personally feel that right then you're losing control, do not persevere or do not believe, well, I'm fixing to go through some great cosmic breakthrough and this is going to be the price I have to pay. If you feel at all disturbed, you feel at all unquieted, frightened, if you feel like you're losing control, regain control right then. That's it. A real revolutionist has got to remember that there is, not in, of course, a 3D city sense, but there is a bottom line to all this. He has got to remember, she has got to remember, it. this is business. You've got to think of profit, not fiscal profit, not social profit, status profit, but profit, real profit. And if you feel like you're losing control, now, hey, I've been having such great thoughts for the last three nights, especially since I've been up for four days drinking coffee. I believe I'm on the verge of being able to see to the other end of the universe if I don't go crazy first. That is not a profitable way to act. If you've got any doubt at all, if you've got any fear, well, I'm about to lose some kind of control. I don't know where it's going. I don't know how dangerous it is. I don't know. But I feel disturbed by this. That is not profitable. Stop it right then. Just stop it. You're not going to lose anything. It's not your one chance. You're not going to blow the one times that the great cosmic forces says, well, those that we would enlighten, we must first make them mad. <laughs> That's just something you read on a bathroom wall at a college beer joint. Maybe that's true in the city, but you ain't one of them. You were mad enough before you started this. You don't need to go in matter. So don't any of you do that. It is not a boon. It is not profitable. But on the other hand, I'm not going to dwell on this because there's nothing really frightening about this. But you are directly, to use technical terms, since I did do a little pre-med, you're fooling around with your nervous system. That's, you're dicking around with your nervous system. You're not going to get hurt any worse than you are. Nothing bad's going to happen. But I want to insist to you that if any of you, and it's very common now, not unusual at all, that you'll go through one or two periods or more of feeling like, well, I feel good, I like what's going on, but I just feel like I'm running almost a dual race, and sometimes right for the last few hours, the last couple of days, I felt like, it just scares me, I feel like I'm losing control. That's the term that I've heard several times, and that's why I keep repeating it. Since you people used it, I've just pick it up because I know what you mean. If you feel like in any way you're losing control, don't analyze it. Don't stop and debate it. Don't think it's your one great chance and the gods are testing you. You're not doing it if you lose control. What do you think this is about? If you feel like you're losing control, regain it right then. Next paragraph. Thank you. I have another question. Let's see if I can make up something real quick that I read. I nah, never mind. I'll just ask a I'll just ask a question. Does anybody find this interesting? I've talked around the edges of this a long time, but it struck me again that it might be right to ask some of you this. Do you understand what I mean by my rhetorical questions? Have you noticed? I'm about to notice for you that nowhere on this planet has there ever been mention of yellow circuit rewards in an afterlife. <laughs> in all religions, all cultures, all institutions, all times, all places on this planet, they talk in the afterlife, the paradise, the heavens. All of the talk is about rewards of a red and a blue nature. Nowhere is there any mention, anywhere, of any kind of faith, religion, mystical system, that the afterlife is going to offer in any way. It's not even mentioned. Yellow circuit rewards. What can you make of that? And here it is, apparently. I've not limited to this description, but at least sometimes I am almost giving you unbelievable, almost unreasonable 
challenges and stimulation to the yellow circuit just through the verbal presentation of this not even taking into account the reality behind the words but just the verbal content and so here you are at least you people putting up with that getting something from it and yet the whole idea in the body of life that comes out through man in general is that this is not ever going to be the full payoff the real payoff is going to come in some way next time around the next life death some other stage not one mention no talk anywhere that there's going to be any sort of yellow circuit reward of any sort doesn't even enter into the conversation the gods never think about it. the prophets never they don't even question it's all blue and red it all talks about blue and red areas being peaceful it, very, it carries from a spectrum of the joys of the red and the blue circuits from that to simply peace good health in the blue and red circuits yellow circuit as far as you could tell once you begin to look at the way I'm describing you would think based upon all the religions that evidently when you die the God somewhere just you know, hits you right here about the top of my nervous system drawing and that's it frontal lobotomy time in a sense of course if I wouldn't be a smart aleck they're going to do that to you then all their promises about all the great red and blue circuit rewards well that's easy to make because they're going to lobotomize you they ain't got to pay off anyway nobody will ever know <laughs> that's really beside the point if that's possible back to the question back to the question what do you make of that what is life up to that has done that and no one's ever noticed of course I point out to you and you're not going out in the street now and burn down churches and attack synagogues and holler what in the world is going on or if I point this out out in the street I could get a bunch of ordinary people who would hear that if I said you know intellectually no religion no religion think about it no religion makes any talk about rewarding getting rewards intellectually after you die if you go by their creed you live their life and I could get people to hear that and they go yeah you're right huh is that all so well, I just thought I'd mention it that's why I got to catch a bus <laughs> what I keep hinting around when I refer to extraordinary topographical surveys and that you should be looking around is this stuff it serves as indicators of information that's not even seen at the 3D level and of course at the 3D level it's seen that there is something in the molecular nature of man that is crying out for some kind of completion crying out for its great fear of death and all that sort of thing as witnessed among other ways by the fact of all of the great apparent intrinsic need to believe in an afterlife and then the afterlife can't be just this not again it's got to be a little bit better if you do something if you join the club if you pay the church if you do whatever but all the rewards all the promises all the conversation about all the rewards in an afterlife completely ignore this what is life up to people don't notice it it's not necessary as I said if I pointed out and got some people to hear it, which I could and they go yeah so what yeah, that's weird never thought about it got to go it means something it's information talking except it's right above it's in the closed caption area it's above the place that you can hear now with 3d ears but you should find such as this on your own or at least when I point out some of it if I don't go into it any further I bring it up for a reason not to be cute and not that I can discover these things hell I can discover them as fast as I can talk I just look around I don't all this stuff about I read and I did this hell I didn't read it I didn't see it oh yeah I guess I saw it if you insist but most of it I just make it up because it's true <laughs> sometimes I do that and it gives people a chill and sometimes I intend to give a few people a chill but how about this 
me point out, for instance, and this is not the one great example, but since I'm here, of me pointing out that no religion, no system of, that teaches anything about an afterlife has ever talked about rewards to the intellect. All right. Now let us say that I am correct even verbally, that no one has ever noticed this. No one's ever pointed out, even by accident, even those stories about, you know, the 10,000 chimpanzees or the 10,000 typewriters would finally, by the laws of accident, average, would accidentally retype King Lear or Moby Dick, God forbid, which you have got. <laughs> that old idea. So if I'm saying even by accident, somewhere, somebody, one time was about to go into some kind of conniption fit. There, you know, they had a tumor transplant and it wasn't taking good. <laughs> and that they just accidentally went, no religion has ever talked about the rewards to the intellect and dropped dead, for all I know. You do understand that doesn't count. I'm no person that ever willfully saw it and understood it. All right, here it is. I don't know if I should complicate you any further. For me to say things like, well, I just make all this up. Take that example that no one's ever seen that. That is, the information did not exist until I said it. I made it up. It's correct, but I made it up. I didn't get it anywhere. Nowhere. Because it wasn't available. It doesn't really exist, in fact, the way in which I'm describing it, because I am taking a, at least a 4D reality, and again, transposing it, squishing it, into 3D, but in a sense, if it's new information, it had to come from somewhere. And in a sense, I made it up. In a sense, anything that you've ever gotten from me that was worthwhile, I made it up. Because if it was singular, this kind of activity, somebody had to make it up. It came from somewhere. Now, if it was already available, you got somewhere else. And I didn't make it up. Any of you who get a chill every time I say, well, I just make all this up, does that help? <laughs> if not, get a sweater. <laughs> an update. Nobody has written about this re recently that I can think about, but you still got time for an update. To remind you that those who can do and those who can't don't, and only those who understand the difference know that there is no difference. It's just been a while since I had covered that topic. Those who can do and those who can't don't, and only those who know the difference know that there is no difference. Let me give you one more of the obvious being absolutely not only overlooked, but from one view, an example of the obvious being ignored sometimes at the very life-threatening peril of those ignoring it, which is almost everybody, the example I was about to throw out to you. And don't any of you would-be reconstituted and refried New Agers get carried away because I'm just going to use the term that you use out in the city, faith healing. Of all the examples, even now, again, some social, if not medical, disciplines claiming to do research in it, after all that, it does take place, as they call it in the city. And I'm not telling you what's involved yet. If I'm not even necessarily going into it tonight. But what they call in the city faith healing, apparent uh, miraculous regression of something. Just a healing that somebody got over it. And apparently, in most cases, it went through some kind of process. Some other human said, be healed. Some other human said, here, hold this crystal. Here, hold my big toe, and I'll chant. And then it seemed to have happened. At city-level consciousness, you kind of people, a lot of you, probably not the ones I should ever tell this to in that way, but probably all of you at city level, and most of you, had some kind of strange belief in that before you ever saw me. But what I want to, this is slippery now, there is almost undeniable evidence that this happens. 
even atheists nowadays in our part of life's body, those who claim to be affiliated with no religion, will almost admit, yeah, there's something going on with the kind of, probably they would say, the, the heretofore, or the only now beginning to understand nexus and byplay between man's brain and his mind. <laughs> More, ma you know, more major scientific breakthroughs. <laughs> or that people now will admit, even some doctors, philosophers, biologists, that there seems to be some way that the human mind, or maybe it's the human brain, or didn't I hear that there was some connection they were studying? <laughs> well, at any rate, it seems to be able to affect, that it seems to be able to cause one to be sick, stress, etc. But there seems to be some statistical evidence that might tend to suggest that with all the human mind, was it the brain or the mind? Well, that in some way you might be able to encourage health. I don't know, there seems to be, I don't know, something's in the air, some of us smell that this could be true. People in Spain, that was true 5,000 years ago. It now seems to have a little more statistical and scientific basis, but here's all I wanted to get at for tonight. Humans driven to say, and humans apparently molecularly feeling the fear of death, that most people in the city, if you said, what gift would you like to have? It'd be good health or long life. Even after they started to say a billion dollars, you say, wait, now wait, think about it a second, you only get one. Don't you agree? Most people say, well, a long, healthy life. All right. Not only is there statistical evidence and a growing awareness, even in scientific communities, that there seems to be a certain aroma that could have some validity having to do with faith healing, or the ability for a person to apparently affect treatment, if not a cure, on their own body through their own willpower, their own resolve, their own consciousness. Are you still with me? And almost nobody will do it, and they'll lay down and die. Nobody will pursue it. And I say nobody, every now and then somebody does. That editor, what was his name, Norman Cousins, claims that he, what it was, laughed himself out of, you know, what it was, terminal gout. <laughs> it was just a reoccurrence of an old theme, but I'm just wanting you to see that in a certain way, if humans were wired up by life to actually feel and experience what they say they want to feel and experience, and to pursue what they say they want to pursue, such as a healthy life. If you went to the doctor, you being every person, and they say, well, you've got cancer and it's too far gone, there's nothing we could do. If indeed people were reasonable, if people indeed wanted to live, that I do not want to die, I don't want to just slowly fade away, lay in, end up in bed weighing 70 pounds, dying a horrible death, can't breathe, I've seen it happen to people, I'll do any fucking thing. But do they? No, sir. Oh, they'll go sell their house and give it to a doctor when the, you know, the hospital says, well, now you know. You have to sign enough papers and there's enough case law, they're not going to discuss that with you, to where they feel like they're protected from any ultimate malpractice because all they can do is say, all right, we're going to do X treatment, whatever it is, chemotherapy, if it's cancer. We're going to do this, but we must tell you, the remission rate in your cases is somewhere just this side of but perhaps if you take the treatment, if you say your house, and how much money you got? All right, two hundred thousand dollars. All right, we can probably uh, we can probably keep you alive another six months. Oh, three hundred thousand. Well, maybe eight months. Maybe eight months. <laughs> and everybody will do it. Now I'm not saying I'm aware that there are there wouldn't be little faith healers out in tents if there were not people here and there that were out and do that. Of course, not all them. It works, or they wouldn't have to carry around the payload of the shields they do. I know some of them. I've heard about some of them. <laughs> the thing is, there is a kind of molecular knowledge in people that knows, not just from scientific journals, but that some of you even get almost as ricochets from some of the stuff I say, that you do know that there is that kind of power, that it's available, and it seems to pop out sometimes in history. You just know it. It doesn't have to be proof. But notice, the majority... We're talking that way in the high, high, high 99s of people, and they say you're going to die. 
I said, oh, well, okay, how long can you make me live if I, you know, sell everything I got and give you in the hospital the money? I said, well, maybe six months, maybe eight months. And nobody ever says, well, if I don't do it, what will happen? Six or eight months. <laughs> they will insist on bankrupting the whole family. Of course, the point of all this is not money, but I simply want you to see that they will do anything. They'll do the obviously unprofitable. That is, the hospital says, well, if you don't take treatments, you're going to live, we say, six months to a year. It's that vague. Well, if I do take treatments, what's, if you press them, they say, well, it's usually six months to a year. But then, ordinary people, if you press them, they say, well, you've got to do something. But the obvious part is, again, what you're going to do is a waste of time. You're going to die at the same rate of speed. And there is already, just at varying degrees, the molecular knowledge in man that you can do miracles. I'm not saying everybody because everybody's going to die. You can't stay alive forever. But they will not do the one thing that is free. They will not do the one thing. They won't even go seek it out to some charlatan, apparently. And you know, heal me. I'll, I'll give you, in the faith healers, of course, you don't even have to sell your house. You know, 50 bucks. What have you got? People won't even try it. They'll go and lay down and die and go broke doing it. Do I have to give even a post-mortem caveat with all this? I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about faith healing. I'm not talking about finances. I'm not talking about getting treatment for being sick. I'm not talking about any of that. The closed caption. you got to be able to pick up the rest of it. People are not insistent upon living. Ordinary people are not properly exercising perfected anger at being slaughtered. They will not try everything to live. They will, in fact, try the very things that have no effect. I'm not talking about medicine. I'm not talking about anything that it sounds like I'm talking about. I'm talking about something else. You don't really want to live. Life doesn't really want you to live any further than you're going to live. But part of the hobby is, well, let's talk about it. There's this operation. There's this treatment I hear about in Switzerland. But hell, I've already, I sold the house, cashed in the insurance. And when I go, the little woman's going to end up living in a ditch or in a cardboard shack somewhere. But there's this other treatment. If I had a million dollars, they're saying that you know, all of that's unprofitable. People are laying down and dying. I always have. It's nothing new. I'm not making a sociological comment. I'm not making a psychological comment. Humanity hollers, I want to live. They holler that I'll give money, I'll support a new bingo wing to the church so that I'll have a greater reward in heaven, in paradise. And yet I want to live. And yet do they? What is up to life? If you fought into this, I guess I got strange enough for one night. Why is it that life makes people, in general, insist and feel as though I want to live? I want to live at all costs. If I found out I was dying, I would do anything. And that's not true. Ordinarily, you will do nothing except bankrupt yourself. Again, the money's not the point. You'll only do that which is not profitable. And just in the strange areas it would seem to be, at the far extremes, up until now, medicine, such as if I use the faith healer to get your attention to start with, people won't try anything to live any longer. Since we're running out of my side of the tape, I guess I can say so make of that what you will. But it wasn't what I was talking about. Six minutes. I had a couple of questions that I've been trying to get to. One is somebody asked me if I'd say something else about why, and they're trying to quote me. I'm not picking on the person, but they're trying to remember what I'd said one time, but why romance is not a good hobby. And they said, what, well, some people fall in love and couldn't it be fun and be productive to this? All right. I said that ordinary romance, you know, the love's a hurting thing thing. 
romance right out of a General Hospital or a Merle Haggard album. The general hobby of being in love. It's always a hurting thing. Those of you who don't know it, I didn't seem to be a recognition, but that was an old song from somewhere, that love is a hurting thing. If you go back and start looking through poetry all the way from the Middle Ages and Western Europe, love's a hurting thing. Love's a hurting thing. Oh, it's been so great when my first girlfriend died and I just felt terrible, but yet now I found another one and I feel just as bad. Thank you. That is what is not a suitable hobby for a real revolutionist. That is the nature. It is not a psychological defect in man. It is not any untoward influences of your culture. That's true everywhere. You got two people together trying to travel somewhere, they're going to rub each other the wrong way. They're on each other's nerves. And when it's got sex tied in, you're already molecularly attracted to one another. That is when it is not a suitable hobby for somebody doing this, a real revolutionist. If you're in a situation that, well, love's a hurting thing, all you're saying is that I sure do like sex and other things that you couldn't necessarily describe, but you're down basically to the good, almost direct run of the red circuit out of the primal flow, the very basis of human life staying here. And that's all holding together as a total organism. So when you got that, you have got the basis of love being a hurting thing because every, if you're going to travel with another person, you can't move when you want to. Somebody's always wanting to go somewhere else, and that is not a fit hobby. Somebody doing this, you have got to find out that is not profitable. If you like other terms, that is not fun. That is not a good payoff. It is not a suitable hobby to play loves a hurting thing involved with this. In the city, I'm aware that it is a suitable hobby. If you took that away, the hobby of loves a hurting thing, what would happen to literature? What would happen to movies? What would be left? I guess it has to be all male jailbreak movies. <laughs> John, John Wayne and the Calvary killing off all the Indians. What's left? If you take out the hobby that loves a hurting thing, Western, not Western, world literature is just down the to toilet. Everything's gone. No more movies to speak of. One or two movies, and you have to see the same ones over and over and over and over. In the city, for the purpose of life, obviously loves a hurting thing hobby is a grand hobby. It is so widely practiced. Everybody engages in it. It's much more popular than bingo or bowling. Hard to believe. But for you, it is not a suitable hobby. And this wasn't a question, but this was based on something I said last Friday, and I thought I'd read it. I like it. It says, it appears that the way in which you treat the group as a whole is not dissimilar from the way that we need to treat ourselves. I left a quote, people who know what they're saying. <laughs> and by request, the tape's running out, but before we go, by special request, at times from the floor above, I hear the sounds of strangers dancing.